Okay, Mr. Marshall, I see the attendees coming on in. It looks to me like you're good to go. It's 635 by my computer and you do have a quorum. All right, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 20th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.36 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the planning agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Uh, we know that Bruce Coldham and Johanna Newman will both be absent this evening. Fred Hartwell. Can you hear me? Yes, Fred. Okay, um, because I don't have access to mute and unmute at the moment, but uh, I am here. All right, great. Jesse Magar. I'm present. Thank you, Jesse. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Uh, she's absent. And Karen Winter. Here. Great. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, first on our agenda this evening, we have minutes. And um, Chris, I want to start by asking you a question. Um, two of the sets of minutes we have in the packet uh, have as their header the word minutes. And the third one, the one from March, uh, says draft minutes. It should and say minutes. I must have written minutes. draft so that I would remind myself. Okay, minutes so draft. all three of these are ready for uh, approval this evening? Yes. All right, great. All right, so why don't we start with the March 29 minutes. Um, does anybody want to make a motion to approve those minutes? All right, I'll make the motion to approve the March 29 minutes. We can have edits uh, in the discussion. Does anybody want to second that? Um, Karen. 
I second. Okay, great. Thank you, Karen. All right, any discussion about these minutes? Um, so I'm going to make one edit, which is that we remove the word draft uh, from the title. And uh, otherwise, uh, I don't have any other comments on that. Uh, board members, were there any other comments on those minutes? All right, I'm seeing a couple. Oh, Jesse. It's not really about the content. It's just that Fred and I were not there. So should we not approve them? And then we don't have quorum for a vote. Is that correct? Or does it not matter? Well, Chris, what do you think we should do? I think. I mean, we could have an entire board turn over, you know, and everybody be new yeah. before the minutes. People can show. vote on the minutes. I don't know if Janet was there either. Were you Janet? No. No. Yeah. You can but, vote on the minutes if you think that they're, you know, adequate. Uh -huh. <laughs> can, uh, Chris, could we, would they be approved if we had, say, three votes in favor and everybody else was absent or abstained? Or do we need five? You don't need five. The new, um, Zoning bylaw says that in order to pass something, you need a vote of the majority of the members who are present. Okay. So uh, I and Janet and Karen could vote to approve, and that would be a majority of the members present, and that would pass. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. It looks All right. like Janet has a comment. Yes, indeed. I see Janet's hand. I was just wondering if we just put them over to the next meeting when Bruce is there. And um, I just, um, so it'd be, I'm trying, we need like either three of five people or three of four people or four of seven, you know, four of six or something. I just don't, I mean, they look like good minutes to me. They yeah, well, but better. you were absent too. So you'd yeah. rather have Bruce present. Yeah, and then hopefully we don't have, well, like Johanna would, oh, she was gone too. This is awkward. We'll wait for the next <laughs> meeting. That's fine. Yeah, so why don't we, why don't we do that? So, um, all right, so I'm going to withdraw my motion to approve. And um, Chris, do we need to do anything else with those to close that and move it on to the No, next but meeting? I must say I was very proud of myself for finally getting around to doing those minutes. Yeah. So. Yeah. They were they seemed excellent. They were very helpful. Yeah, I was ready to vote in favor of them. So we'll just um have that on for the next time. You can just feel good that you got that done and behind you. <laughs> okay, so the next set of minutes are from August 2nd. Does anybody else want to make a motion to approve those minutes? Why nobody wants to make mo our motions tonight. Well, All mean, right, Jesse, you just beat out Karen. Um, move to approve the August second minutes. All right, Karen, will you like to second? I second. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, did anyone have any comments on the August second minutes? I thought they looked good. All right, then we'll go ahead to a roll call for the August 2nd minutes. Um, let's see. Starting with Fred. Hi. All right. Uh, Jesse. Hi. Janet. Um, I'm going to abstain just because I was listening to that meeting. I wasn't really present and I didn't, wasn't there for the whole meeting. I was on the, on, I was in a parking lot somewhere. So, but I think you have a majority. So. All right. Abstain. And Karen. Aye. Okay. I'm an I as well. That's four in favor, one abstention and two absent. All right. Moving on to the August 16th minutes. Anybody want to put their hand up and? I will. All right, I, move Janet. To, I move to accept the August 16th minutes. OK. Uh, Jesse, is that hand to second it? I'll second. All right. 
Anybody have any comments or notice anything about those minutes? No, they're excellent. Other than that they are pretty timely. <laughs> okay, all right, so we'll go ahead and vote on those, starting again with Fred. Aye. And Jesse? Aye. Janet? Aye. Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So that's five in favor with two, abs two absences. All right, thank you all for that. All right, we'll move on to S to the second item, which is our public comment period. All right, so it looks like we have two attendees this evening at this time. One is Robert DiCarlo and the other is Tim at BDG, probably Berkshire Design Group. I suspect these are both here for the public hearing on the site plan review coming up later. So unless one of them want to make a public comment, I will conclude we have no public comment. OK. <clears throat> All right, so no public comment. So the time now is 647. And we'll go on to item number three, which is a public hearing site plan review. SPR 2024-01, Bonnie and Robert DiCarlo at 86 Gray Street, request site plan review under a site plan review approval to construct an addition to an existing owner occupied duplex under section 3.321 of the zoning bylaw, RG general residence zoning district, map 11D parcel 107. All right, um, so you've brought Mr. DiCarlo in and maybe you should bring in Tim at Berkshire Design Group too, Pam. He doesn't want to come over. <laughs> I think Tim is here for the A&R. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, then we will leave him in the public for the moment. All right, so Mr. DiCarlo, welcome to our meeting. You can unmute yourself. If you have a camera, you could show us your your face. And um, do you have any sort of introduction you want to give us to this project? Can Pam unmute him? OK, there it is. So Mike, can you hear yep. me? Yes, we can now. Yep. Yep. Do you have a camera or not? I got, it says my name up there and I'm on, <laughs> um, okay. but I'm on my computer and I it was, it showed me, I don't know why it's not showing me. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Uh, so before you, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us an introduction? Remember that we really can't see you. And um, if you want uh, Pam to bring up any of the drawings that you submitted, uh, you can direct her as you do your presentation. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Robert DiCarlo. I live at 86 Gray Street in Amherst. <clears throat> Been living here since 1989. <clears throat> and um, we are putting in a request to uh, put an addition on the house so um, I can and my wife can uh, basically be able to age in place and have um, on the first floor of the house um, a bedroom and a bathroom so that we can be able to uh, to to move on with our lives and enjoy Amherst. Okay. Um, Pam, why don't you bring up the drawings? Okay, so we're seeing, uh, at the moment, we're seeing the survey um, and that the proposed addition is toward the rear of the existing two-family dwelling, uh, extending out to the south. 
and that, that it's in front of the existing barn and shed and barn addition. Uh, Pam, why don't you go uh, on to the second one? So That's this the is the site plan. Showing the addition, I guess it's a roof plan. And then now I'm seeing the three renderings of the addition. Um, view from the southeast, view from the south, view from the southwest, maybe. All right. And then here's an architectural drawing of the floor plan and the maybe the ground or the foundation of oh, the demolition plan that is showing the bedroom. Um, I guess a small room to the right of the bedroom, maybe a laundry room beside that and then the existing bathroom. I'm, I'm saying those spaces from left to right. Does that seem right, Mr. DiCarlo? Yes, that's what the plan says, yes. Okay, great. Can you see the uh, plans on the screen? Yes. Okay, you can. Okay, great. All right, then maybe I don't need to go through them in quite so much detail. All right, and then now Pam has brought up the uh, photos of the existing lighting that I think you we at least received this afternoon. The first page had a, a fixture on the end of the barn. Uh, the second page, which we're looking at now, has a pendant fixture on the porch. Um, and Bruno the greeter. Yeah. I'm sorry? Br Bruno is our greeter. Oh, that's your, <laughs> that's your dog. OK. There he goes. Yes, he's part of the family. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the third image uh, is a nighttime image of the house with the front porch illuminated by the pendant fixture. And then moving on, I think there's a nighttime image of the pendant right up close to the porch. And moving on. an image of the fixture on the barn uh, at night. All right, so uh, maybe we should consider that the introduction to the project and presentation of the materials. Um, I know we did a site plan review, or at least maybe one only, or maybe two of us did a site plan review. Uh, did Jesse and Fred both make it over there? Yes, we did. You did. Okay. And Chris, did you join them? I did. Yep. Okay. So Fred or, or Jesse, would either of you like to describe the site plan review and what you saw? Well, it was, uh, you know, as, as described, uh, it's, uh, uh, and it, as, as someone who, uh, lives two streets over in a comparable building it uh, it's it, the, the, this concept of aging in place is something that i'm intimately familiar with and uh basically i certainly support the uh the application i had i have a couple of questions when we get to that but um basically uh, there's uh, i see no reason not to go forward with this Okay. Were there any aspects of the project that you were able to understand better when you were there on site and that the rest of us might not appreciate yet? Jesse? Well, not, not really. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's adding to the, to the area of the first floor and um, the we have limitations in the bylaw regarding lot coverage, but the we also have the calculations that were circulated, and uh, that does not appear to be in question. So, okay. I I did have a question on the uh, parking space count. I I can't imagine how you'd ever get ten cars there, 
and I'm a little curious how that was done. You only need four uh, under the bylaw for this situation. So I'm not really concerned about it, but I am curious how they got to 10 cars. Maybe right. someone why don't can we... help me with that. Yeah, why don't we hold that question for a minute? What, uh, sure. Jess, Jesse's got his hand up. Maybe he has uh, something from the site he wants to share. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, simple addition in the back, and it does add more uh, visibility from the street since it does bump to the south quite a bit. But, you know, really not concerned at all. They have a nice big yard, and the design is very much in character with the house, so it'll, it'll look totally fine, in my view. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Okay, so uh, now's the time to have board member questions. And Fred, sounds like you've got the first one in here. Um, Mr. DiCarlo, do you want to comment yes. on uh, 10 parking spaces? <laughs> I, I, I don't know where that came from. I, I don't know anything about 10 cards. I, I have no idea where that came from. I don't know what that is. All right. Well, I do remember seeing it. Um, Fred, do you remember where that was? You know, next door there's a house and they, I don't know whether you're gonna get confused with them, but they um, put a big area in the back and I don't know whether you're confusing uh, 86 with the house next door that has a bunch of students living there. And um, and I don't know the numbers, but I don't know where that figure came from. I, okay. I don't know about 10 cars. All right. Well, I'm trying to remember where I saw it at the moment. Chris, do you remember where that showed up? Yeah, it's 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 uh, on the, uh, the 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 color rendering. It says 86 Gray Street parking plan, and in uh, black pen it says N equals 10 space number of spaces 10. Yeah. Okay, I do see that. Um, I have, yeah, I have no idea. Um, and it looks like my handwriting, but, um, mm -hmm. I don't know why that number is in there. Okay. I really don't. It's the, yeah, it's my, I did it. Um, I don't okay. know why. I mean, I just Chris, don't know. Chris, you know. does that figure have any official status? It's from the rental registration, um, application so it's the plan that was filed with rental registration i think nate must have gotten it from that is that right uh -huh. Nate? right yeah so this was the parking plan with the rental registration permit so i think it was just you know the assumption that if it's 100 feet long you can fit five cars if it's double wide it's 10 um i don't think there was any okay um, any you know any more than that i think it was just to show that it had ample parking for the two units all right <laughs> But it's not like you're asking us to approve a parking plan for 10, 10 cars this evening. We don't have 10 cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So board members, are there other questions or things you'd like to discuss on this? I do, do see that Chris had suggested some things to talk about in the development applications report. So... Oh, Janet, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I have one question, but I just have a comment, which is, you know, this looks like a really attractive, well-maintained house. And I thought the addition really fit in, you know, in terms of the look um, and, you know, and so I just, it looks, you know, and if it helps um, Mr. DiCarlo and his wife to stay in Amherst in his house longer, I think that's great. Um, Mike, I have a quick question just about um, how many bedrooms are in your um, rental unit? Or I, I is it upstairs? I couldn't tell because the house is quite large, but I couldn't tell. We we don't have a rental unit. Um, we have, oh. so, yeah, we did have a rental unit. Um, and um, right now we don't rent it. It's all our own family. We don't have any renters. Okay. So... Um... When you rent it, how many bedrooms are in the space that you rent? We rented upstairs at, at the time as a one bedroom um, unit. Okay. It was only part of the house. It was not the full upstairs. Okay. So it was a one bedroom self-contained unit. Yes. Okay. 
Janet, any other questions? That was my only question. Okay. Uh, Fred, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, no big deal, but I think somewhere in the uh, final site plan approval action, it should somehow mention that uh, the uh, we are satisfied that the uh, driveway area uh, will is, is is sufficient to accommodate not less than four cars and four vehicles and uh, and let it go with that. I think it somewhere because that's the that's the minimum in the bylaw. Uh, for a two family and uh in the and uh, i i think that the number four should be there somehow because the number 10 i i just uh i i, I don't think it's right to have the number 10 in there mm -hmm. okay uh chris i see your hand you could make that a finding you could make a finding that the driveway can accommodate for the required yeah. four cars yeah. Now that's what I would like to do. Okay. So that's one finding. And may um, I say one more thing? I just wanted to acknowledge that um, Mr. Malloy, Nate Malloy, wrote the development application report. Oh, so, okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Nate. All right, Fred, are you, did you have other items? I still see your hand. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we go through the development application report and just make sure we touch on each of the items that Nate suggested we look at here. So starting, um, starting on page two of that report, um, waivers, uh, request for waivers of landscape plan, soil erosion plan, sign plan, lighting plan, and traffic impact statement. So we'll want to make sure that we're okay with that. Maybe I'll just turn off my video for a while. Um, issues, I don't see any under proposed use and changes to current to previous permits, none under building and architecture, none under special permit to modify dimensional standards. So uh, those are all being met. Accessory structures, issues to consider. There are two existing sheds at the rear of the property within the setbacks, the applicant has stated that these will be removed. The board could make this a condition. Uh, Mr. DiCarlo, uh, would, uh, will you in fact be, do you in intend to remove the two sheds? Yes. Okay. All right, so board members, uh, Fred, I see your hand. Yeah. Um, I. I, I certainly agree that Mr. DiCarlo can remove the sheds. Uh, I ha have a little bit of a problem making that a condition because I would approve this with the sheds or without the sheds. I don't see how they bear on the approval. Mm -hmm. So I would rather not go there if we don't have to go there unless I'm not thinking of something. Okay. Um... Nate, uh, I see your hand, and I was going to ask you about: Does that affect the lot coverage that you're? The um, they the sheds are are too close to the side setback. So if he was willing to keep them, it would ha have to be a special permit from the planning board for the for the setbacks for the the two sheds, the one behind the barn and the one next to the barn. And so, uh, so even so, why would he need a special permit? for something that exists and he's not touching because there was never a permit to to have those built right so there one of them i think is on the property line and so we wouldn't allow that in terms of its height to be located where it is so nothing is grandfathered right and uh, so if if in fact he had not come to us for a site plan review 
those sheds could remain and be there for decades to come? Right. So if they're small enough, they don't ha even have to have a building permit. So it's something that would only be brought to our attention through something like this. So it's a retroactive review of, of something that's already in place. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. I'm going to let Chris go next. I see her hand. I just wanted to mention that the um, barn did receive a special permit to be closer to the property line than was um, necessarily allowed. So the barn is um, acknowledged and has a special permit, but the sheds did not receive special permits. And I don't know if it was the previous owner who put those in or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, Janet. So I think the alternative, if we don't make this a condition is, you know, Rob Morris says, oh, you know, you didn't get the permit, you need to move them, like just he would be enforcing the building code. Um, but this kind of feels like the Eversource thing where, you know, in the course of looking at their application, we noticed this huge pile of debris in the backyard, um, you know, just accumulating and we sort of added that to the permit as, you know, I don't know if it was, in, you know, I don't know if you're allowed to put a huge pile of debris in the end of your property, but it was just sort of kind of a cleanup kind of thing. So this sort of feels the same way where the applicant is agreeing to stop the violation and remove the sheds or move them somewhere else, you know, within. And so we're just kind of making sure everything's tidy as we go forward. I mean, otherwise we, we would sort of kick it to Rob Mora and, you know, back and forth and stuff like that. So. All right. Well, uh, Mr. DiCarlo, I, since you are are willing to remove those sheds, um, I guess we need to make that a condition of this site plan review. Um, if you were not willing to remove the sheds, we'd need to have another hearing for a special permit, but sounds like we don't need to go that way. I agree with you. Um, I didn't wanna make an issue of it and I didn't wanna pursue special permits, $500 fee, extra time. Um, it just wasn't worth us for all of this, worth worth it to us. And um, it's okay with us to take it down as long, you know, we just want to comply with what you guys want us to do. You okay. want us to do it, we're going to do it. It's really simple for us. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, that simplifies life for us. So, <laughs> so that would be a condition to remove the sheds. All right, um, that was the bottom of page two of the development application report. Uh, I don't see an items, items under uh, article six or uh, paragraph seven, utilities. Um, will there be any equipment or utilities on the exterior of the structure? And um, Nate, are you thinking of a, like an electrical line that comes to the wall of the building and then drops down or? Well, I'm thinking, you know, I think for every project now, especially with electrification of homes, you know, is there going to be an outside compressor or mini split or something of that nature? So the, um, you know, like on the, on 462 Main Street, 446, you know, there's banks of mini splits and it's, you know, it's, it's becoming more prevalent. So I just think that, for every project, we should be asking this, right? Because it could all of a sudden go on the front porch or it could go somewhere where we aren't looking. And so it's something that can be considered. And so that's, okay. that's why it's there. All right. Well, Mr. DiCarlo, do you have any uh, exterior mechanical equipment that you are thinking of using uh, in a, so to, to heat or cool this addition? Yes. Um, we currently have too many splits in an outside central air conditioner. And um, we intend to put in a, um, um, you know, a, a means to, uh, to heat and cool. And we were considering a mini split, yes. All right. And would that be, where on the, on the site would that new mini split be located? We, right now, as of this time, um, I, I no final decision is made because we haven't decided on the type of mini split, the type of unit, um, uh -huh. because, you know, there are a bunch of different um, 
ways to do it that's um, at this point in time undecided okay when we when we come along with it and you know and look at everything at that time we're going to have a better vision of how you know you, you see it all together and then you'll be able to figure it out does that make sense to you I understand what you're saying. Um, Pam, do you think you could bring up the site plan? I'd just like to find out where the existing mini splits are. Okay, well, maybe that first one with the colors, that's yes. better to look at. So Mr. DiCarlo, where are the existing uh, units that you have? Um, one is, um, is you, um, okay. It would be see with it, see the indentation um, right there, and it, it's um, right there. It's in that indentation. Okay, There's so it's, 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 it's in the recess on the south side of the house. Yeah, it's on the ground. Yep, and where's the other one? The other one is on the back porch of the um, of the house. Okay, so that's up at the top of this plan for the house. Yeah, it's on the top of the porch. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, Chris, do another, we need to the know? other one could possibly go right where the other one is on the ground, um, in the recess. In the recess, which is the, the probably the uh, the best place to put it aesthetically and mechanically. Mm -hmm. And there's some room there that remains. But, yeah, it's recess. So there's plenty of room, and it's it. It has a better um, aesthetic effect because it's mm -hmm. sort of hidden a bit, you know. Okay. Um, Chris, from your point of view, do we need to know where this additional unit might go in order to approve this site plan? Or I us? think you could um, make a condition that says um, that if the mini split is not put in that recess, that Mr. DiCarlo would come back and show you a plan as to where it's actually going to go. Okay. Uh, are you willing to do that, Mr. DiCarlo? Yeah, I, I agree with the, yeah, I agree with that because I think, um, as we're discussing it, I think it does make more sense to put it there than any place. Yeah, I, I, okay. I think that, yeah, I think that's going to be the place it's going to be. Okay, and Chris, uh, when you word that, we should. We shouldn't limit it to a mini split in case the decision is to do something else. So equipment. So the yeah the mechanical any exterior mechanical equipment should be located in that recess on the south side of the house. Otherwise, they should come back. Okay, and may I just say something that um he he probably won't know until he talks to the um, mechanical people. Yep. As to exactly where that has to go, because I know that they have very specific specifications. Yep. Well, I mean. So that's fine. I'll just. Yep. Give, so given that... where he's at and that he came yep. to us now, this is how we should, I guess yep. we should deal with it. Uh, Fred, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I agree with what we did with the sheds, but this looks to me like micromanagement. Uh, if he finds out from the uh, HVAC people that they need to put it a little somewhere else, uh, he's going to have to come back and we're going to have to modify the, this site plan approval. No. Uh, that is just, uh, it, it, it is excessive. I would not include it as a specific condition. So um, quickly, I'm just going to jump in. I think if it's not there, we could say that it should be shielded from view. So I think the issue is that we're seeing a lot of these happen where someone will put in an addition or maybe a few units. And during the site plan review process, we don't look at any of the utilities. And then they go in some place that just ruins the whole thing. They put it like right on the front of the house or on the roof or someplace that actually you know obstructs the view. And you know I've spoken with the building commissioner a few times about it. And it is something that is totally valid to talk about during site plan review. And so... I don't consider it micromanaging. I get it. It's only could be one unit, but what if what if he ends up deciding that he wants to put, you know, electrify the whole house and put five mini splits in, uh, five outdoor units? And so I think something could be more generic about just having it in a place shielded from view. But I think it's something the planning board 
you know, I'm going to start putting it in de every development application report as a consideration, you know, outdoor mechanical equipment. Uh, so I think it can have a really big impact on, on a site plan. And when you say shielded from view, you mean from a public way? Right. I mean, so I have the Google Street View pulled off of what it looks like now. And, you, you know, it's pretty difficult to see that one unit. Um, and so. Yeah, but but let's say the unit ends up on the rear of this addition on, mm -hmm. you know, on the west side. That right. wouldn't that would be shielded from view. It by the be, addition. Yeah. Right. And you wouldn't need to put any shrubs around it or a fence or anything. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's the condition could be that could just be that, right? In a location that's shielded from public way or shielded from view of the public way. Not not specifically saying this nook here, but any. So, I, I guess I mean I'm with apologies to Mr. DiCarlo. This seems like we've touched on something that the board is hasn't thought much about. Um, so if I'm a homeowner and I decide to electrify my mechanical system and I want to put in a mini split, do I need a site plan review and I do nothing else to the house? No, this the use requires a site plan review. That's yeah. why it's here. So if it was just any any other instance, it wouldn't. Okay. So if let's say he did his addition now and he used the existing steam system that's in his house and just extended it or bought a bigger boiler, he could do that. And then he could come back in five years and say, now I'm going to want to electrify. I mean, yeah, but I, yeah. I, mean, I think it's it's more relevant to bigger projects, like say the one on 133 uh, Southeast Street, you know, they put yep. 60 mini splits on the roof and it was visible and it's something that yeah. hasn't really been looked at. And so, you know, like I said, okay. I think it's this is a smaller case, but it's something I think the board could be asking uh huh. Okay. All right. Well, um, I guess uh, to keep the thing. Well, it's Janet. You want to interject here? Well, I just I, I'm kind of in a way glad we're talking about it. Although Mr. DiCarlo may not. I just I'm a little. I had sort of the same question as Fred or concern. Um, and I'm wondering if the building commissioner is requiring when people apply for mini spits to shield them if it's in view from the street. And in fact, my neighbor, Caddy Corner, the street, they have some splits that are in the, you know, the front of the house right by the street, and they did put up some nice screening. So is that something that building commissioner is requiring and which makes sense to me, but I just, is that in the code or is that just a recommendation or should it be? Um, and, you know, it does seem different to have one mini split versus, you know, 16 or so, but I just, right. I just a little, inter I'm interested in this topic, but not really clear on it. Yeah, the, sorry, I'll, yeah, the code doesn't necessarily require it unless it's a noise thing, right? So if you have to attenuate noise, some decibel level, but there's no code to screen it, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, you actually need airflow around it. So if there is screening, it has to be set back a certain distance, but, you know, for instance, the local historic district commission these are things that they look at because, um, you know, oftentimes the contractor will put it the most convenient place for them, but maybe not the best place in terms of a site plan or aesthetics. And so that's the only reason why it's been brought up. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I get, I don't really have an issue if it's only one here. It's just really something to consider for every project. And some might have more of an impact, you know, one unit as opposed to, you know, 20 or 30 or more. Right. All right. Uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, I can. I guess I can get my head around some very general language about uh, shielding from view or something, but I don't want to go beyond that. I, uh, I I think it's, and if there is a policy issue here, then it is, frankly, I think it's something that we would need to look at in the zoning bylaw uh, so that the, the people who are involved in these projects uh, uh, have a you know a, a, a basis to know what's what they're looking at ahead of time right uh, I, I, again if 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 we have general language about shielding or something uh, from public way I can get my head around that but I don't want to be any more specific than that okay. Let me, let's hear from Jesse and then maybe we'll try to work on that language. 
Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. I think a general statement about being shielded from view from public way is great just to let the applicant know that that's an issue. Mm -hmm. It's like okay. anecdotal, but when we did ours, we weren't aware, and then suddenly we had to go get approval to actually make a shield to cover ours. But right. just so that the discussion is happening from the beginning, I think it'll be very useful. Right. All right. So, um, Chris, uh, maybe uh, a statement that any any new exterior mechanical equipment should be located so that it is not visible from a from a public way. Um, is that sufficient, I guess? Uh, knowing this parcel, I can imagine that even that recess, uh, you know, if you come, if you're farther down south on that street down toward the corner, you probably could see what's in that recess. Um, and I'm not sure that would be a problem from my point of view. Um, I wonder whether if we just said it, it shouldn't be visible from the public way within the, you know, it, uh, directly abutting the parcel or something so that, you know, if you're just right in front of the house or right along the, the street between the property lines, it's not visible. I just like, is, can I make a comment? Sure. Um, one of the things about this is just for your consideration is that with mini splits, um, there's a certain distance factor. And um, you just don't want to get into that area where you're requiring it to be beyond that. Um, yeah, you can only extend that line for so long. And beyond that, it's not going to work. So that's just mm -hmm. my two cents worth for my understanding of mini splits. Yeah, you're talking about the refrigerant line. Yeah, you can't you can't run it longer right. than it's man it's designed for. If you go beyond that, you're going to be in trouble. And the wiring on that also, mm -hmm. um, you can't split and and um, and and tie that together because the signal won't go through up through properly. So there are some mechanical um, and electronic issues. I'm not trying to you know tell you what to do, but I just think you should understand. The consideration of of what the application is going to involve. Right. Well, it's not uncommon for a, a site plan review for the applicant to have some idea of what they would be putting outside the building and where it might go. Yeah, the so. place that you're talking about now, that's okay. I mean, that space. I yeah. I think you know I I. I, I think that's going to be an okay place for it. I'm not concerned about that. Um, I'm I'm talking in general, um, right. Donald. And I'm trying to help just just give you some information, and that's all I have to say about it. Okay. All right, Chris. Um, what kind of language have you, have you got at the moment? you're muted. Uh, Chris, you're muted. Chris, you are muted. Sorry, I went through all that language. <laughs> um, any new mechanical equipment shall be located so that it is not visible from the public way directly abutting the parcel or immediately in front of the parcel. Mm -hmm. So board members, how do you think, does that seem okay? Uh, from your point of view? Does anybody object to that? I guess I should say, raise your hand. <laughs> um, Doug? Yes. Can, so she's saying it ha it can't be in view of the abutters or I didn't quite get the two different no. views. Well, no, the, the idea was that if you're on the street, essentially right in front of the parcel itself between the two, the two east-west property lines, that you can't see the unit. That way, if if you're farther down the street toward the corner, you know you're looking obliquely toward the side of the house. You could see the unit, but you're farther away, and it's not as obtrusive. I can't hear you, Janet. You oh, are. Oh, I did it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, Fred. Yeah. Um... I'm thinking about the uh, uh, compressor 
condenser for the full house uh, air conditioning unit that is uh, that cools my residence, and it's tucked in a an interior corner between a one story addition and the main body of the house. But it would be visible from the street, except for the fact that I have a nice thick hedge that runs all the way along the sidewalk on the on the front lot line. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that this is all that objectionable. Um, you know, and, and I, I admit that there is a point, you know, and the uh, point Nate brought up about uh, Southeast Street, uh, that is, is certainly a case in point, but. So for this one, maybe you would just not bother. To... I, 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 th I think uh, this is uh, a bridge too far. I, I don't like this precedent. Uh, I, okay. I, you know, I understand on a major project, it's, and I applaud Nate for raising this and, and making it maybe a standard part of uh, a report, but on a, on a house this size in a neighborhood like this, it's, I, I think it's excessive. But, okay. and, you know, and, and just, you know, raise it on the development report. And, uh, but, uh, you know, this is our job to decide whether or not it, it really is necessary here. And uh, the, the owner makes a point uh, about there, there are mechanical limitations on refrigerant lines. So, right. Uh, Anyway, okay. my preference. Right. Thank you, Fred. So board members, uh, Fred's taken a different uh, approach and suggested we not do any sort of condition associated with a mechanical unit on the house. Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, so I'm not seeing any hands raised and I'm not, ah, uh, Karen. Um, am I muted? Wait a minute. You are not muted. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, in, in this case, I feel perfectly confident that uh, Mr. DiCarlo is going to be uh, concerned about the aesthetics of his house and is going to do the best he can to make it pleasing. So even without conditions, I, I would approve this. But um, I don't think to put this general wording in is is necessarily a bad idea because as Nate said, we should kind of focus on in the future uh, that we're concerned about not giving just a green light to all electrical things um, that anybody wants to do. So in this case, I would approve it without um, any conditions. I feel confident that it's not going to become a problem here, but I would also welcome the fact of having uh, a general comment saying, um, you know, uh, if electrical equipment gets added onto the house, um, there's a concern that it will be done in a way so that it will not mar the, the uh, be, be a hindrance or a distraction from the public view, something like that. All right, so you could go either way. Yes. All right, Janet. I think Karen has struck a nice balance because I, you know I feel like I look at a lot of compressors and um, mini splits, and you know that you know you probably would be nicer if it was screened. But I, so I, I think it's kind of kind of jumping. You know, if that wants to be a requirement or a change in the regulations, I think we should do it that way. But I think for one house, it's sort of an odd thing. I think. It makes sense with a larger development if someone has a whole line of compressors and mini splits to say to shield that. I think we did that for the Unitarian Church. We or that maybe the Design Review Board or did that. But I, I do think it's sort of an odd thing just out of nowhere, just for a single family house to bring right. that up. I think Karen's hit a nice balance. So it sounds like you would fall on the let's not bother to do a condition. I think so. I, I kind of I kind of you know. I kind of agree with everybody, but I think I, I'm leaning towards Karen. 
Well, I, I, I didn't interpret Karen as saying we should not do a condition. I think she said we should. So oh you're, you're coming sorry. down on the opposite side. And I'm agreeing with everybody in every possible way. So <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I'm right. so sure to. <laughs> so I'm going to sort of, I'm going to agree with Fred that for this particular si situation, we shouldn't bother to do a condition. I'm, I'm going to say I agree that it's great that Nate brought it up and we should bring it up on each project and have a conversation about it, but I don't think we should always make a condition about this. So, um, Jesse, where do you stand? I think I'm a little mixed. Um, <laughs> thinking, okay. th thinking of my own experience, we had a new one put in and they showed up and they said, oh, the company didn't have the size you want, so they gave us the bigger one and they installed a massive presser in my driveway, which I didn't even want to see. So we ended up building a screen, right? And it's very visible from the front. I'm sure my neighbors didn't want to see that either. So I'm sure they were glad we built the screen. So I, I, I would be okay with a very general condition of if it's visible from the public way, uh, efforts should be made to screen it or okay. it needs approval if not, or something like that. All right. Well, that's again, sounds... in this case, I don't think it actually pertains to this particular case. I think we're talking about precedent more than this example. All right, so Mr. DiCarlo, uh, we've heard a variety of approaches here, um, but it does seem like there's at least a couple of members who think it would be worth us doing a condition that says, if it's visible from the public way in front of your house, uh, that you would be required to screen the, the mechanical unit from, from view. Is, is that acceptable? If that's what you want, if that's what you want, I'll do it. Okay. All right, Chris, why don't we record that as a draft condition at the moment as we go through these yeah. topics? All right, so unless anybody objects, I'm going to go on to further down the development report here. Um, so the next item was stormwater management, and uh, Nate was suggesting we ask how the runoff from the roof is going to be managed. Uh, Mr. DiCarlo, will you have gutters? Will you have downspouts? Uh, where will the downspouts discharge if you do? Um, we don't, we have um, gutters in the front of the house for the, uh, for the walkway and we're going to put gutters on the, uh, the addition. And, All right, uh, and, and those will drain into downspouts yeah, that are. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna put that on. And those will discharge to onto the surface of your property, adjacent to the house. Correct. All right. Um, any, I don't see any hands from people. That sounds like an acceptable management. Lighting. Uh, so I, I did notice in the in the uh, photos that the fixture on the barn is not uh, certainly not dark sky compliant. Um, and are you are you putting any new lighting on your property? Exterior lighting? No, the the existing lighting that we have should uh, cover everything. Okay. Um, does anybody object to the existing lighting and want Mr. DiCarlo to change it? Okay, not seeing any response. Uh, no, number 11, site plan, no, no issues. Site management plan. Uh, no issues, parking and circulation, no issues, traffic, no issues, work within town of right of way, no issues, and no, no further issues. All right. So it sounds like we have one finding for uh, parking, uh, that there are at least four cars accommodated in the, in the uh, driveway one general condition for the mechanical unit to be screened if it's not if it's visible from the public way in front of the property 
and then Chris, you had sent a couple of addition, additional con conditions. Uh, one was that the project shall be built in substantial accordance with the site plan approved by the planning board on this date. Second, the project shall be managed in accordance with the management plan approved by the planning board on this date. And then, oh yeah, the third one had to do with uh, removal of the sheds in the bar backyard that do not comply with, exist with, with current setback requirements and that those should be removed. All right, board members, are there any additional comments that anyone wants to make at this point? And I still don't see any other members of the public in the attendees uh, list. Janet. Um, I just wanted to note that in the um, management plan, they said that the lighting around the house is motion activated. So it turns off, it's like, you know, activated, it's for safety. And so it sounds like off at night, unless somebody's creeping around. Right. Good. Okay. Chris, do we need two votes, one on the findings and one on the conditions? Could wrap it all in together. And I would suggest that it, you make a finding that it meets all the uh, relevant criteria of 11.24. Yeah, I was thinking I did that was put we down a little um, motion on that email that I sent. Right. Okay, Janet. Um, we should close the hearing too. Right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, let me let me see if I can cobble together this motion. Uh, we we would find um, that the that the Let's see, the, the project meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24 and that the driveway can accommodate the four cars required in uh, by the bylaw. We, uh, we impose the conditions, the three conditions, um, uh, actually four conditions. One is substantial accordance of the site plan, one in accordance with the management plan, that the sheds be removed and that the any mechanical units on the outside of the building be screened. And then finally, that the hearing uh, be, be closed. Um, and that you um, and approve that the approve waivers. The app, or we approve the application with the conditions as, as discussed. And the waivers. And the waivers, uh, that's right, as requested. So that was the four waivers that I read off earlier, oh, I guess it's five. The landscaping plan, soil erosion plan, sign plan, lighting plan, and traffic impact statement. So did that make sense to everyone? Chris, are you, do you think you have that? Mm -hmm. Between Pam and me and Nate, I think we have. Reasonably recorded, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess, since I've been doing all the talking, I will say I, I, I make a motion, I move that we uh, adopt the findings that we've described, adopt the, the conditions that we described, uh, approve the waivers that were requested, um, and um, that we close the hearing. I will second, nicely done. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, any further comment from anyone? Okay, so we'll go through and in what has become the usual order for tonight. Um, Fred, how do you feel about that motion? I vote yes. All right, thank you. Jesse? Yeah, approved. All right, Janet? All right, I think you said aye. Aye, sorry, I was- I got cut off. Uh, Karen. Aye. All right, and I'm an aye as well. So that's five in favor. Two members uh, continue to be absent. All right. All right. Now we'll move on. 
So the time is 740. And we'll go to item four on our agenda. Uh, this was uh, entitled Planning for Housing Growth. And uh, Chris, do you want to just basically bring up the, I think it were three plans that you had, you and the planning staff had put together. Yeah, these are really in preparation for the meeting in person that we have in a, another week, I guess. Um, and But we thought it would be worthwhile to just show them to the board give you some time to think about them before we all come together next week. Chris? Nate was Nate was the person who drew these plans, so maybe he would be the better person to um, present them. Okay. But um, they're really to give you an idea of places that we thought would be worthy of um, examining for uh, rezoning, um, either you know for an overlay district or something okay. of that sort to allow more housing to occur in these locations. Uh, Pam, could you uh, adjust the zoom on this so that we can see most of the page? I, I can only I can only see maybe the top third of the page. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, if you go to the uh, line of controls at the top, you see where it says one hundred and three percent. No, I. I don't see that, Doug. I don't. I don't see my PDF controls. I only see the share screen controls. So. Oh, because the share screen controls are covering, are covering the PDF. Yeah, and I'm trying to put them at the bottom, but I can't get them to go there. So, Nate, if All you right. have these as well and want to share your version, um, what is this? Well, um, oh, now I can do it. Look at that. Yeah, why don't you go to like 50%? All, All right. right, so this is this is University Drive. And um, so Chris, uh, I assume, or Nate, I guess these boundaries are the areas you are thinking we might consider for an overlay district that might be geared toward housing. Is that right? Right. Yeah. I mean, Chris said it. I, yeah. I mean, the idea would be, um, you know, there's three areas, University Drive, East Amherst, and then, um, you know, say we'll say North Pleasant Street. And the idea would be, you know, uh, they don't have to be rezoned the same thing, but we've talked about rezoning both East Amherst and areas for possible student housing or denser housing. And so, you know, these are put out there for that consideration. You know, mm -hmm. really, what are the appropriate areas? Um, and I think also, Doug, you mentioned if there's areas adjacent to the university, if we meet with Tony or Nancy or other representatives from UMass, you know, is there a way to say we're trying to bring something to the table, right? What kind of collaborative effort do, would we have if we could rezone areas near campus? Um, how could that be an incentive for them to do anything else? And so, you know, that's part of the consideration for this one, especially. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think that's you've you've shown us all three images and um, kind of introduced the topic. Uh, actually, Janet, yep. I saw University Drive, and then I'm looking at the Amherst Center. What, was there something? Was there a second one that I missed? Uh, yeah, this one. Okay, College Street. East Amherst, it's it's labeled University Drive, Drive, but it's really East Amherst Village Center. You know, oh, yeah, for, that's the web GIS. I guess I didn't change the title in the when I when I was making these. Okay, so, so I, you can discuss how to shrink or expand this, but this was our idea of the area that you might want to look at. Uh -huh. I would love to see each of these in larger maps. Um, I don't have like if I look at it on my computer, it's just I see pieces of it, but especially for the meeting, I think it'd be good to have not just an eight by 11, but a larger map of each area. Cause um, it's complicated. There's a lot of complicated zoning there. And um, are you, are you recommending this red part here, College Street as for densification? I think, it's, I think it's, uh, it's that it's everything within the black boundary, the, the, the thick black line that goes from uh, close oh, to the I railroad see. tracks see, all the way down see. Belchertown Road. Okay. Right. Right. I mean, so there has been discussion about East Amherst and, you know, there could be 
it could be simpler to say, well, the commercial, that's the red, you know, just be changed to BVC, right? That could be one approach or one approach could be, is there an overlay zoning that has um, discrete sections or districts within it that has different design standards or different, you know, densities or something. And so, you know, instead of just focusing on one zoning district, it's really about what is the area that would be appropriate to say for East Amherst to help encourage redevelopment. You know, Bruce Coldham said uh, he'd love to see a gateway somewhere, you know, something designating a village center. You know, this is the main entry into town from the south on along Route 9. You know, is there a point at which we'd want to see, you know, three-story buildings or something and have a streetscape as opposed to some, you know, that was there now. And so really it, it is, I guess Chris mentioned, a starting point for discussion. Right. So we could think of it in as a uniform uh, response or, or break it down into smaller parts that are treated differently. Mm -hmm. is uh, that Janet, I uh, see your hand. Um, is that Stanley Street at the tip of the Belcher Town Road thing? I can't. Yeah, that is yeah. Yeah, that's Stanley Street. So that, uh, okay, that's all single. Okay. Okay. And Jesse. Yeah, thanks. Question for you, Nate. Um, maybe there's not a simple answer. I'm just wondering. You know how you just you put these thick black lines as sort of consideration. How what guided you know the nuances of where those lines went? So for example, the one we're looking at now, why not Whitney Street? But why yes to the street to the east? Uh, sorry, west. You understand what I'm asking? Like, like yeah, yeah. How so that's... these shapes determine? Yeah, I mean, some of it's existing zoning on the ground. Uh, you know, uh, boundaries. The one on the west, there's the railroad, you know, it's the railroad, and that's the commercial district where uh, Hamshaw Lumber is located, and then Railroad Street right there. And so, I mean, at some point, you have to consider, right, what is a natural break or what was what makes sense. And so, to your point, Jesse, if if the plan board says, well, why couldn't we have more um, of South Whitney Street, then that's a possibility. Uh, you know, what the planning board I really talked about was along the Route 9 corridor, uh, and, you know, it wasn't necessarily rezoning all of East Amherst. And so, you know, that could become part of the discussion. So really it was trying to follow some of the pattern that was there already in terms of properties fronting the road and what, you know, what some good setbacks are. Okay. All right. Um, Thanks, I'm just curious as I look at it. Yeah. Great, thanks, Jesse. Karen. Yeah, I wonder if it would make sense to, uh, and when we approach this, to first look at these three zones kind of, uh, and then, try to discuss which one makes the most sense for us to concentrate on, uh, which would be maybe the least problematic. Um, so in the first meeting, I agree, it's a good idea to look at the three of them and maybe big maps would be necessary, but at some point then we should decide which, which, yeah. The priorities. You know what I mean. priorities. <laughs> exactly. Sure, that sounds good. Uh, Janet? So, you know, looking at East Amherst Village Center, and, you know, this used to be the village center, or the, the original village center of Amherst way back when, when I think it was still part of Hadley. And I'm kind of surprised at the exclusion of the common, um, all the commercial buildings around Main Street and Pelham Road and Northeast Street. I mean, that's, that's the village center. And so as well as, you know, the core commercial pieces. That just sort of surprises me. But whatever we pick, I think we have to also um, not just say, you know, here's what we're talking about and here's what we'd like to rezone or do an overlay. But I think we're really initiating as a planning process to work with the neighborhood businesses and the residents and um, to involve the public and stakeholders. And so I think it could be a really exciting project, but I don't think it's just going to be us sitting around saying, oh, let's draw these parts in the map and up zone or down zone. So I just want to, you know, I'd love to do this for any of those parcels, but I, I think, um, you know, to me, East Amherst seems to be on the cusp of some really exciting developments with the new school that's going to be a community center. You know, the common can use some TLC and then the businesses to the, um, I think my direction's right, to the um, north, you know, and just, I know that's being considered also for historic districts. So to me, it's like, we can kind of revive that whole core and bring in um, College Street and all the businesses there. And I think it could be a really cool place to hang out and walk. 
which it isn't right now. It's hard to walk around there. But I do think we should look at this in the context of a more formal planning process that really involves our community and the store owners and the people who own properties and people who live there. Yeah, I mean, I will say quickly that, you know, probably half a dozen property owners in East Amherst have approached the town and said they'd like to have something rezoned. So they're not happy with commercial or the residential zoning. And so some of East, some of the reason why East Amherst would be appropriate is that we've already had interest from a number of property owners saying that they're, you know, they really can't do much given the zoning that's there. The, the zoning is just weird. It's just all over the place. I know there's six zones in, in the, in the, in that black area. So it's really, you know, it's really inconsistent in terms of how it's zoned. Um, you know, I think, you know, you mentioned the common, I mean, we might say that RVC is appropriate for that part of the common, that part of East Amherst, because it is older and it's a residential structures. And so it could be, again, something that planning board looks at, you know, do we want to extend anything north or are we, you know, happy with how it's zoned now? Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks, Janet. Um, Karen? Um, no, I forgot to put my hand down. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Chris? I just wanted to note that this is one um, section of town that does not abut the university, but the other two sections do abut the university. And so if we were to do something on University Drive or on North Pleasant Street, it might potentially spur the university to do something in those two locations. So just think about that. And maybe, you know, that's worthy of a discussion with Nancy and um, Nancy Buffone and Tony Maroulis when they join you. And I hope that they're going to be able to join you on October 25th for your October um, in-person meeting. Okay. All right, Nate. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the other two areas are things where, you know, I mean, I, I would consider that's something where we could have student housing, right, or something dense and different than East Amherst. And so it's a whole nother conversation that the board talked about last time, you know, what, where do we where would we want to encourage off campus student housing? There was the article that was forwarded to you about what's happening in Canada. And so those other locations are something where you know, staff had said, could we be more creative in terms of allowing density uh, and allowing that kind of um, those apartments. And so, you know, that's just something to consider as well. You know, it's not, it might not even be a zoning district we have right now. It's really about, you know, how can we help this housing problem and start trying to, you know, get a little bit more balance in the, in the market and demand. So. Okay. Thanks, Nate. Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't I meant to lower my hand. Okay. Jesse. Yeah, I guess just to echo what Nate said a little bit, um, looking at the university drive map and something in my household we've talked about for years that, that feels somewhat underdeveloped, especially, uh, and it might have less thorny issues in that area because it just right. doesn't abut as many neighborhoods. Right. Um, and I think that's a great, great place to sort of start with some more density if, okay. towards, towards the student idea. All right. Um... Don't see any more hands, and uh, we can continue the conversation next week when we all get together. Okay, thanks, thanks, Nate and Chris for bringing those to us this week. All right, uh, the time is seven fifty-four. Uh, we often take a break when we have a long meeting expected, and. Um, I guess I'm I'm not sure how long the meeting's going to go tonight. I know we have the one A and R, right? Um, we actually have two. We have two A and Rs. Okay, yes. so maybe what we should do is just take a five minute break now, and we'll come back at eight o'clock. It's uh, by my clock. It's seven fifty four. So call it a six minute break. Um, please mute yourself. Turn off your phone or your uh, camera and uh, come back at eight o'clock and turn on your camera when you are back. Thank you.
All right, uh, I have eight o'clock on my clock here on my terminal. So Thank you. Anybody that's around, Chris, uh, you are not muted. Sorry. That's okay. So Chris, should we wait a minute for Nate or should we go ahead? Looks like everybody else is back. Right, um, I think we can go ahead. Pam has um, illustrations of these ANRs and you have one in your packet and I don't, I don't think you received yeah. the other one in your packet, but um, we'll right. explain it to you. Okay, well, at the moment, the next item on the agenda is old business. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we'll... yep, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll old go business. ahead here. All right, so the time now is 8.01, and we will resume our meeting uh, after, uh, I guess, a total of seven minutes of break. And um, next item is old business. Uh, topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Anything? I don't have uh, anything. No. Nothing from Chris, nothing from Pam. And then uh, new business, any unanticipated items? No new, no new no, business. No new uh, unanticipated new business. OK. All right, so now we're at item seven. Time is 8.02. We can do the Form A, A and R subdivision applications. I'm so, also going to, I just brought Tim over. I believe it's Tim Armstrong. OK. From. Berkshire Design Group. Yeah, I'm not seeing him over yet. He's coming. It takes. It, oh, there he is. Okay. It it takes a hot second. It's kind of funny. Okay. Um. So now I'm just gonna. I want to share my screen. Yep. Okay. So Chris. So Chris. Uh. Yeah. It looks like this is. Okay, this is the one that was in our packet. Mm -hmm. This was the is the one that. Is this the one that Mr. Armstrong is here for? I think he's affiliated with both of them, if I recall correctly. All right. Tim, Tim, have you made it over as a panelist? Yeah, I can start to talk about this one. Okay, um, why don't you go ahead? These are two properties in South Amherst that on West Street, in fact, the gray line that you see on top of the uh, western, or the leftmost drawing is the driveway into the Crocker Farm School. So these properties are just south of Crocker Farm. And last winter, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals approved um, a duplex on the property to the south. Um, and in order to be able to have a duplex in that property, uh, they needed to add land area, add lot area. So um, the property is being reconfigured to give the property to the south the appropriate amount of lot area to accommodate a duplex. The um, building to the north is already a duplex and the land that is left um, after the reconfiguration will still accommodate a duplex to the north. So there'll be two duplexes. Um, so Pam has drawn um, a blue box around the northern property and a yellow box around the southern property. And mm -hmm. then on the right, you see that <clears throat> the southern property will take um, a piece of land that's shaped kind of oddly. I don't know, know how you would describe that shape. It's almost like a dog's bone or something. Um, but that property will be added to the southern property to create a larger property. And it says the combined lot area will be 26,001 square feet. And that will be enough to accommodate a duplex on that property. And if Mr. Armstrong is um, here now and can speak, maybe he has some more things to add. 
I think I'm here now. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that sums it up pretty well. Um, I think the weird lot shape of the parcel A is to get around the kind of features of that lot to the north to make sure we clear and give them enough room for the what's going on on that lot. Is the new property line as I go from west to east, uh, is that following the uh, southern edge of the driveway and then the parking area? Um, I believe as part of the special permit for the house on the south, they were going to remove parts of that driveway. Um, okay. This line itself was part of that special permit package. Um, All right. So this is identical to what the ZBA saw? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and it's it looks like both parcels have frontage and uh, would not be subject to subdivision uh, uh, bylaw. So board members, do you agree that I can go ahead and sign that, that our approval under the subdivision bylaw is not required? Uh, maybe I'll ask the reverse, which is, does anybody object to my signing? Oh yes, Fred, I, now I see your hand. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, the uh, drawing made by this, looks like it was made by a surveyor, seems to show uh, definitely that the Southern uh, property has the uh, 15 feet uh, required setback to the side bound. But the uh, GPS of the same uh, uh, property looks a lot closer to the side bound. So I'm just, is, is our GPS that far off? I, I just have to ask that question. Um, yes, the GIS is really far off in some locations, particularly the farther that you get from downtown. It's quite um, quite noticeable. Okay, far. well, I just I just wanted to ask. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Fred. Any other comments from the board? Okay, so Chris, I'm not seeing or hearing any objections. So I guess we can consider that the board is okay with me signing that we do not need to review this. Okay. Parcel number two. Hmm. Let's see. So this is an upcoming ZBA application. Yeah. No, that's not that's not what I'm trying to share. We're not there yet. Yeah, no, no, that's actually left over. It's not part of tonight's presentation. Okay. Nope. You want this one. So here it is. Here is property that is on West Bay Road as well as West Street. It is 11 parcels are involved. Um, and they're actually, this property is all in the ED. It's owned by Hampshire College. And they're going to be changing boundary lines that we're gonna create one parcel here the bottom left and another parcel here at the upper right. And then what is left is a third parcel right here. Do you agree, Tim? Did I say that correctly? Yes, that is correct. As okay. far as I understand it. So that the one, two, three parcels down along the corner are not changing? Correct. The two of those parcels, one is the Eric Carl and the other is the this Yiddish one? Book Center. And the one in the very corner is a parcel that had been previously A&R uh, and has their solar field currently. 
Okay. Um, so Pam, do you have a second drawing showing how it's being changed or not? Or, or simply the changes that the two large parcels at this sort of extremity all the way to the left and the one in the upper right are being carved out of the of a larger parcel that includes the, the bulk of the property. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think um, I can explain it a little bit if you don't mind my jumping in. Sure. Um, Hampshire College um, a few years ago carved up their property. You can see some faint property lines on this. They don't show up very well on this uh, image here, but um, the faint property lines carved this property into lots of different um, gerrymandered parcels. And I think that what Hampshire College was trying to do was to um, have uh, the ability to mortgage some of those parcels. And what my understanding is now is that they don't need that configuration anymore. So they're going back mm -hmm. to a more normal um, way of configuring their land. And mm. out of these 11 gerrymandered parcels, they're going to three parcels that make more sense. That's my understanding of this situation. And maybe uh, Tim Armstrong has something to add to that. Um, yeah. So I believe part of this is they are looking to refinance some of it. Um, the bulk of campus is on the remaining land um, at this point. And I think that was their, I believe is their intention is to re redo parcel lines to help uh, enable some financing to keep the college going. But it sounds like are the dotted lines uh, depicting what now exists? And, and, so and we're, we're actually consolidating? There are currently there multiple long, narrow parcels that run through this entire property. Um, okay. Almost mm -hmm. like a bowling alley state starting at West Street and running across it. That yeah. are very old. Uh, boundaries that were not determined by the survey since they're all interior. Um, the lines we showed are all from recorded a &R plans that the college has done over the years, surrounding buildings and parking lots and those kind of things. Um, they're the only things that are easy to identify on the ground at this point. Nate is okay. going to show you how it looks now and it's really kind of crazy. Okay. Those are the property lines now. And you can see that they're long, skinny properties, but some mm -hmm. of them have very odd shapes. And this was a this was an A&R plan that Hampshire College did a number of years ago to carve this property up into all these different um, lots. And now they're kind of putting them back together. Okay. All right, yeah, that's that's helpful to understand. That's a good image, yeah. Janet? I have three, three. One thing to say is that, I don't know if this is the lots we're looking at are um, new kind of the long skinny lots. That's actually how the whole town was carved up in these kind of long shoe bar box parcels during colonial times. And so um, that's a really traditional kind of looks. So I'm not sure if that's from like, the 1700s or if that was just a weird thing but um you know all the parcels along southeast street were carved out that way you know east street in hadley you know everybody bought these or got these lots or were given these allocations off the street and all the way back to the wood lot so i don't know if that's like leftover they just had a really um wild idea so that's one thing but I'm a little confused about what it's going to look like afterwards is that also shown i mean usually pam does a nice yellow marker so if you can just show me what it's you know, i could see what it's, what is there where, what it's going to my third my third thing is are they planning to sell any of that or just kind of just feel like adjusting their lot lines like what's the point of it and is there a plan to sell parcels i don't think uh, there's any plan to sell i think it's really a question of refinancing which is what they did a few years ago that so. is my understanding of it as well um, and there are college buildings on all of the parcels. So to sever it would require 
more work on their part because of that. Someone just um, showed me the three new parcels. I think I was looking at them, but I'm a little, it was a little confused. Yeah. Pam, Pam, if you if you bring the plan up, Pam, I can just annotate it on Zoom quickly. Okay, because they're also in the online packet, and I don't know why I didn't put them here. So hold on. Okay. Okay, so lot two. Yeah, it's basically the remaining okay, so land. This is lot one. Two and lot one, right? This lot is one. one. This is lot two. Okay. And the remaining land is this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So the remaining land is the one that has the least frontage. Correct. And it has one. A uh, narrow set of frontage on West Street and maybe a little bit on West Bay Road, kind of. There's a tiny the, sliver on West Bay Road in this in the very center. It's the Uber flag lot. There's no requirement since this is in the ED zone. There's no dimensional requirement requiring a certain amount of frontage. So oh. the fact that it has very little frontage is not. Um, it's not antithesis to the zoning okay. bylaw. All right, all right. Okay, members. Uh, I guess uh, Chris would like me to come in and sign this too. Yeah, that's fine. Any any objection? <laughs> all right. I'm not seeing any hands. Hope you're all still out there. All right. Um, so I guess we can consider that this one is acceptable to the board and that we don't need to approve this in some other format uh, like the subdivision bylaw. Thank you, Tim. And uh, sorry to make you wait so long this evening. Thank you all. Um, it's better waiting at home than it is when I have to show up to these in person. <laughs> okay. Have a good night. You too. All right. Um, moving on, it's now 817. We can move on to item eight, upcoming ZBA applications. Anything we might want to consider? I don't have any new ones to tell you about. OK. Well, just quickly, the Valley CDC submitted their comprehensive permit application for uh, the um, their product on, well, we'll say Ball Lane, but it will be Montague Road, the corner of Montague Road and Pulpit Hill. And so a transmittal will be going out for that um, next week. And the planning board could have an opportunity to review that in October or November. Okay. Um, next item, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. Anything coming in? Yes, we have the Jones Library that's coming in. Um, I think they're, I don't believe they've submitted it yet, but they're planning to submit it soon. And they're hoping for um, um, a, a session with you either in late October or probably late October. Yeah. And that would be a site plan review? That's a site plan review, yes. And they've been to the Design Review Board and they've been to the Historical Commission for the demolition of the um, 1990s building and I think they're still conversing with the historical commission about the um, historical preservation uh, restriction um, so that will be coming before you soon okay all right moving uh, to item number 10 uh, planning board committee and liaison reports why don't we why don't we, well, let's see. Okay, PVPC, Bruce is not here. CPAC, uh, we did not nominate anyone last meeting. And um, I, I know there was discussion about trying to twist Janet's arm because she wasn't there. <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't vote you in without you in the room, so to speak. <laughs> So uh, does anybody feel more inclined or in the case of Janet, inclined 
to uh, volunteer for CPAC. What's Jesse doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a really you know, interesting. We're trying to break him in slowly. Okay, I think it's a really interesting committee. It's I think it'd be kind of fun, but their busy season is the fall, which I think yeah. I'm going to be still working on the solar bylaw thing. So that was right. my main issue. It's the fall yeah. is my busy oh, yeah. okay. season. This is a bad fit. What about Johanna? She's not here. Yeah, I don't. I she she declined last time. Oh, okay. Um, you know, how many times a week do they meet, Chris, these days? The CPEC? Yeah, in, in the fall. Is Nate it is more familiar with their okay. schedule than I am. Nate, is it basically no more than once a week, and it's not on Wednesday nights? And Yeah, they, they meet probably once every three weeks. I was trying to, I think they, you know, their busy time is the fall. So proposals are due on the 30th. And then they'll start meeting in October to review them, and they hope to have recommendations done by, you know, in January. I think even so, it's you know a few months of, um, of meetings. I was just trying to go to their website. I thought they had listed their schedule. Mm -hmm. if people are were interested, but it, it you know there is you have to read proposals, review them, make recommendations, and then there's hearings. Um, yeah, right, so I'm mean, so, say yeah. So I'll volunteer. And, and we'll just see if I can keep up. <laughs> it looks like, yeah, so it looks like they're they're going to be busy November, December, and into January. So maybe two and a half months, three months of meetings. Okay. All right. So I will volunteer. Does anybody want to second that motion or that action? I'll <laughs> second. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jesse, I saw your hand, and I think I heard Janet. So... Pam, yeah, you, can pick, you can pick one of them as a second. Um, any discussion? <laughs> Does anybody want to? Uh, well, OK, so I guess we need a vote. So uh, shall we go through and vote on my volunteering to be on CPAC, uh, starting with Fred? Oh, did we lose Fred? Oh, there he is. Yeah. No. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, Jesse? Yes, and thank you. Um, Janet? Yes. Um, Karen? Yes, thank you. And I will, uh, I will abstain. So that's four in favor, one abstention, and two absences. I quickly, Doug, I was going to share the screen. I found it in their okay. most recent meeting packet. All right. Uh, so proposals are due on the 30th of September. There is an internal review in October where committee members would submit questions by, um, you know, in October to the, get back to applicants. And then they have a pretty aggressive meeting schedule, you know, on Thursdays. It looks like, you know, you know, November 9th, 16th, 30th, and then December 7th, 14th, and 21st. So they're going to meet six times. And I guess the hope is to get reports, everything done by the by the 21st of December. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have another family member who's on the ZBA, and I can't tell whether some of those dates overlap. So I know we only have one terminal here to do this. So, okay, well, let's try that and I'll see if it works. All right, thank you all for doing that. Um, moving on to DRB, Karen. Um, I think the first meeting is on Monday that I'll be part of. Okay. Janet, Solar Bylaw. You're, you're muted. We perceive that we're towards the end of a first um, hard draft, although I can't guarantee that. Um, and, you know, there's sort of a, the tough issues are farmland and forest lands and, you know, how much solar to allow or whether to allow, um, you know, on lands that have other purposes 
in and of themselves, but also help towards climate change and resilience. And so that's kind of an issue dividing the committee. And um, Chris is working very hard to draft language that um, kind of brings bridges that divide or, you know, whatever. So it's really tough. It's a tough issue. And um, anyway, and also appreciate your comments, Doug. So Chris, do you have something to add? Cause you're really on the front lines. Um, no, but I'm working towards getting a um, clean draft together. I had I have a draft that has everybody's comments in it. I just put Doug's comments in today to that draft, and now I'm working on putting a document together that's easier to read that doesn't have all those comments. So I'm going to give both of those to the Solar Bother Working Group, which I think is meeting on Monday, Monday at 6, I believe, the 25th. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're um, we are zeroing in on a final draft. And will this draft or the eventual draft come to the planning board before it goes to town council, or will it go straight to town council? And if they are okay with it, they'll refer it to us for the public hearing. It could come to the planning board. Would you like it to? Well, uh, you know, I guess. Uh, I guess the question is, do you guys want us to have a chance to edit and meddle with what you've done, you know, as a filter before it gets to uh, town council or or not? I mean, I, I, I'm not, you know, we, we've got other things we could do or, it's but. Actually, uh, yeah, it's a great question because it, it it's a great question because you know, once it goes to town council, the town council will shoot it to us, to the TSO, to CRC. Um, but I would think the the more groomed the draft is, the better. Yeah. You know, that makes well, sense. I, I, you know, I've said, I think I've said this before. I'd hate for you guys to spend a year, do a draft, and have the board here, the planning board, not recommend it. You know, that that would be kind of you know, like we wasted a year. <laughs> um, yeah. And we actually did not resolve the, the issue in a funny way. I mean, you know, it's, it's we may yeah. not be, be saying this is our recommendation. It might be sort of divided too. So I, I don't well, know. And I guess the other <laughs> thing is if your committee is, is, is really evenly divided between a couple of different approaches, you know, it might be worth to hear from us on what we thought if we could break that, break that uh, tie, so to speak. So, I mean, I guess we'll, we can leave it to you guys to decide how you want to proceed, but, you know, That's at some point, at some point it'll come to us and, and hopefully it will be something that we can support. I, you know, this is a, it's a great question. I would like to bring it to you before it goes to town council, if not for, um, what should I say? edits but more to get to have you understand what's being proposed and to give comments um and so uh, but your schedule going forward is very busy you're supposed to have a um, presentation of the Shutesbury road solar project mm -hmm. on october 4th and then you have jones library on october 18th so that leaves sometime in early November because October 25th is your next um, in-person meeting. So right. anyway, I, I'm going to be talking to um, the town manager about, about yeah, I, I think that's, it's worth just yeah. batting around yeah. how, how to, how to route this thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and I guess I you know I can imagine the Shutesbury project will be pretty time consuming and could be a long meeting with lots of public comment. I would um, think so. Yeah. And but I I actually don't really have a sense. I I don't really know what to think about the Jones Library and whether that's going to be highly controversial or not. You know, it feels to me like the design has been maybe less controversial than the funding. So, but I could be wrong about that. So, you know, is that a possibility that we tack it on to that meeting? I, um, I don't, 
you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm just sort of thinking mm -hmm. whatever you, you guys know what your timeline is and if it, if it can wait until after we get through those two projects, great. I'm not sure we know what our timeline is. <laughs> we, we're aiming for the sixth. I'm not sure we're going right. to. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Fred, I see your hand. Uh, yeah. Um, Chris, maybe I should just take some time and come in uh, and discuss this with you. Um, there's a there's a there's a small but to me important technical issue in the draft bylaw, and that is there's a reference to the applicable applicability of the National Electrical Code, and that technical reference is absolutely wrong, and uh, it it should be it should point to an entirely different code, and uh, it's going to get. Uh, this I, I realize it's in the uh, model bylaw. The model bylaw is equally wrong, and I, I say this is the secretary of the committee that does the National Electrical Code in the state of Massachusetts, and that reference is wrong. And uh, so I I, uh, I just want to make sure that we we track that, uh, and, and maybe I should just come in and and chat with you about that. Sure, I'd be happy to chat with you about that. Yep. Chris, would it make sense to have Rob in that meeting, or or you know one of the electrical inspectors? Yeah, somebody so. from from the town electrical side. Yeah, who, somebody who understands the technicalities. Yeah. Because I don't. So, um, Fred, why don't you give me some times that send me an email with some times that you're available to meet, and then I will um, arrange something with yeah. Rob. Uh, will will okay. do. All right. Good. All right. Um, Janet, I think that was all about the solar bylaw working group. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm sorry to have gone on so long. No, but, I, I, I actually think this is a really important question. So yeah, we want to take your, your last year of work seriously. Um, CRC, Chris. The CRC brought its um, rental registration bylaw to town council. And then it went to the finance committee. And I'm not clear on where it is now. Unfortunately, I haven't been going to the CRC meetings. So I don't know if anyone who's more knowledgeable um, knows the answer to that question, but I don't really know where that is right now. Okay, all right. Are you no longer participating in those meetings or you just have missed the last couple? I participate in those meetings when they deal with something that I'm directly working on, but Dave Zomek is their official staff person. So I don't staff the meetings. I just attend when they're dealing with zoning amendments. Okay. All right. So one way to say it is they haven't been dealing with anything, any zoning amendments lately. So, so That's you right. don't have anything to report. I could have said that. That would have been shorter. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next item, report of chair. I don't have anything to report. Chris, report of staff. I don't have much to report, but we are interviewing for a housing planner. Um, we had two interviews today, and we're going to have a couple more coming up and we're happy about that. The housing planner is an associate planner position 25 hours a week. And we're hoping to get some help for Nate in the um, realm of increasing affordable housing and staffing the municipal housing trust. So that's gonna be um, you know, really helpful to us here in the planning department if we can get a good person in that slot. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. Okay. All right, uh, unless anybody has anything else to say, I can say it's 8.34 and we can adjourn. Thank, Thank you all you. for joining us this evening and we'll see you in person next week. And are we starting at six o'clock again? Is that the plan? That's We would that's like to do that. Seemed yep. to work okay last week. Yep. So, uh, and Bruce will not be back, right? So we no. will we will be six members. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks Thank very you much. All. Thank Good you. Night. Bye. Goodbye.